Bienvenue à cette conférence de presse. Mon nom est Émilie Bergeron. Je serai la modératrice pour ce point de presse. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, on est en présence du ministre de la Santé, euh, M. Jean-Yves Duclos, et plusieurs représentants de la santé publique. Euh, il va y avoir une déclaration d'ouverture pour faire une mise à jour sur plusieurs questions de santé publique. Et ensuite, on aura une période de questions. Comme d'habitude, on va commencer avec les questions dans la salle. Et en fonction du temps euh, qui va nous rester, on va y aller avec les questions par Zoom. Donc, si vous êtes avec nous euh, par Zoom, euh, vous pouvez euh, dès maintenant lever la main euh, et comme ça, je saurai que euh, si le temps le permet, on pourra aller à vous. Et euh, on a jusqu'à euh, 11 heures euh, pour les questions avec le ministre et les représentants de la santé publique. Donc, la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup, Émilie, euh, Madame Bergeron. Et bonjour à tous euh, et à toutes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, tout d'abord, uh, de la part de Santé Canada, une bonne et heureuse année 2023 à tous et à toutes. Bonheur, paix et de la santé. C'est un plaisir de m'adresser à vous aujourd'hui pour la première fois en 2023 avec mes collègues, le collègue des docteurs Tam, New et Tunis. Ce matin, nous aimerions faire une mise à jour. Et en réponse à l'augmentation subite des cas de COVID-19 en Chine et en raison de la quantité limitée de données épidémiologiques et de données sur les séquences génomiques venant de ce pays, le gouvernement du Canada a temporairement mis en place des exigences de dépistage avant l'embarquement pour les passagers aériens entrant au Canada en provenance de la Chine, de Hong Kong ou de Macao. Depuis le 5 janvier 2023, ces passagers doivent fournir à leurs transporteurs aériens un résultat négatif à un test de dépistage avant l'embarquement. De plus, à leur arrivée au pays, les voyageurs qui sont passés par ces territoires au cours des dix derniers jours reçoivent des informations. Canada is not alone in this decision. Fifteen other countries, including the U.S., have uh, adopted these measures. Our actions continue to be guided by caution, and we will not hesitate to adjust measures protect, to protect the health and safety of Canadians. The situation evolves. Those border measures will be re-evaluated. Action, our actions will continue to be guided by prudence, and we will not hesitate to continue adjusting them to protect the health and safety of Canadians. We're also putting in place additional wastewater pilot projects at the Toronto and Vancouver airports that will focus on direct flights originating from China and Hong Kong. Work is underway with industry partners, and these two projects are expected to start later this month. They will further enhance our ability to track the emergence of variants coming into Canada. These projects will build on the Pan-Canadian Wastewater Surveillance Network, which monitors the spread of COVID-19 in our country and is in collaboration with federal, provincial, territorial and municipal governments, as well as with many experts across the country. Wastewater monitoring is a key tool for public health surveillance. It can alert public health officials to where diseases like COVID-19 and new variants of concern may be spreading. Earlier this morning, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization published their initial considerations for future COVID-19 booster doses for 2023. I thank NACI for their guidance. This is a good reminder that if you have not received a booster, a bivalent booster this fall or winter, it's not too late to get one and get better protected. Boosters remain one of our best defenses against the severe outcomes of COVID-19. We also need to protect the overburdened healthcare workers by doing everything we can to stay healthy. I thank Canadians for contributing to this effort by staying up to date on their vaccinations and continuing to practice individual public health measures such as wearing a tight-fitting, well-constructed mask and staying home if sick. Earlier last fall, parents and caregivers were particularly concerned about their difficulty to find children's analgesics. As of today, 
3.8 million additional bottles of these medicines have been made available to parents and caregivers through increased domestic supply and foreign importation. I also wish to inform parents and caregivers that a major pharmaceutical company, Elon, estimates that an additional 1.1 million bottles would be, will be available at pharmacies and retailers across Canada for the month of January. This is very encouraging news as we are starting to see some good signals that the overall pediatric analgesic supply situation is starting to improve. We will obviously continue to work very closely with all our partners, including manufacturers and provinces and territories, to address these shortages both in the short and in the longer term. This brings me to the last topic requiring an update today. Through the interim Canadian dental benefit, first available to children under 12, the Government of Canada is helping to reduce financial barriers and help families access the dental care they need. The application process for the benefit began on December 1st, and as of January 11th, more than 90,000 applications have been approved, representing nearly 146,000 children who will be able to get their best smile and protect their health. I didn't give a short update on the discussions taking place between the Canadian government and the provinces and territories on health care investments. These conditions, these discussions continue collaboratively in the best interests of patients and health care workers. Five fundamental areas of shared priorities are our common focus. Reducing backlogs and supporting our health workers, enhancing access to family health services, improving mental health services, helping Canadians age in dignity, and modernizing our health care system in part through a better use of data to save lives and increase the quality of care to Canadians. As the Prime Minister has said, we are confident that we're going to get to a good place. I'm personally very optimistic and I'm looking forward to significant and positive developments in the weeks ahead. Les discussions entre les provinces et les territoires... The discussions between the provinces and territories and, uh, Territories on investments in health care are proceeding well. We continue to work in the best interest of patients and health care workers. Five fundamental areas of priorities are our focus. Reducing backlogs and supporting our health workers. Enhancing access to family health services. Improving mental health services. Helping Canadians age with dignity and modernizing our health care system, among others, by improving better use of it, but through better use of data, rather, to save lives and improve the quality of care. As the Prime Minister has said, we are confident that this collaborative work will allow us to enhance our public health care system and make it accessible for all Canadians. Thank you. I'll give the floor to Dr. Tam. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everyone. First update of 2023. I hope that everyone had an enjoyable holiday season. Public health activities have raised everyone's awareness of healthy habits and ways of living. Let's capitalize on that and focus on preparedness for future public health events, including protecting ourselves from COVID-19 and other circulating respiratory viruses. The latest data indicates that COVID-19 activity continues to fluctuate across the country, while both influenza and RSV have settled into expected seasonal levels. However, the healthcare sector is still recovering from the pressures of these viruses in the, our population. For this reason, it is still important to do everything we can to prevent severe illness. In its statement released today, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, reminds us that booster doses of COVID-19 vaccine 
are an effective tool to reduce the risk of severe illness and death. Taking measures that reduce the likelihood of hospitalization remains important for all of us since it subsequently affects health system capacity. If a full booster was recommended for you and you haven't got it yet, now is a good time to get a bivalent booster. As we continue to monitor national and international data, including COVID-19 disease rates, but also contextual information, like the level of immunity in the population, we are seeing an increase in the proportion of sequence detections associated with the XBB.1.5 variant. Through whole genome sequencing of clinical specimens, XBB.1.5 is known to have been circulating in Canada at 2.5% during the week of December the 25th to January the 2nd. This proportion is projected to rise to approximately 7% in Canada by mid-January. While XBB variants are expected to increase in Canada, it is not known whether they will become the dominant lineage. Nationally, the absolute number of cases is not surging at this time, nor is there evidence of increased severity with this or other new variants. In 2022, the Omicron variant resulted in the highest numbers of infections in Canada to date. Fortunately, over time, there has been a general trend towards decreased severe outcomes, such as critical care admissions and deaths among hospitalized patients. This may reflect the impact of vaccines and infection-induced immunity changes in the characteristics of the people infected and changes in circulating strains. Like the winter weather, it can be difficult to predict exactly what we're going to see next, but we do know it's too early to put away our winter coats and boots. Similarly, it's still too early to stop taking the personal protective measures that have helped us weather the COVID storm. At this time of New Year resolutions, public health remains resolute in our commitment to foster health, fostering health within our populations by promoting health, preventing disease, illness and injury to achieve optimal health and well-being for all people living in Canada. Happy and safe Lunar New Year to those who celebrate. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello. Welcome to our first update of 2023. I hope that everyone had an enjoyable holiday season. Public health activities have raised everyone's awareness of healthy habits and ways of living. Let's capitalize on that and focus on preparedness for future public health events, including protecting ourselves from COVID-19 and other circulating respiratory viruses. The latest data indicates that COVID-19 activity continues to fluctuate across the country, while both influenza and RSV have settled into expected seasonal levels. However, the healthcare sector is still recovering from the pressures of these viruses on our population. For this reason, it is still important to do everything you can to prevent serious illness. In the statement released today, Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization reminds us that booster doses of COVID-19 vaccine are an effective tool to reduce the risk of severe illness and death. Taking measures that reduce the likelihood of hospitalization remains important for all of us since it subsequently affects health, health system capacity. If a fall booster was recommended for you and you haven't received it yet, now is a good time to get a bivalent booster. As we continue to monitor national and international data, including COVID-19 disease rates, but also contextual information, such as the level of immunity in the population, we are seeing an increase in the proportion of sequence detections associated with the XBB.1.5 variant. Through whole genome sequencing of clinical specimens, have shown that 
uh, XBB is known to have been circulating in Canada at 2.5% during the week of December 25th to 20, January 2nd. This proportion is, was projected to rise to approximately 7% in Canada by mid-January. While XBB variants are expected to increase in Canada, it is not known whether they will become the dominant lineage. Nationally, the absolute number of cases is not surging at this time, nor is there evidence of increased severity with this or other new variants. In 2022, the Omicron variant resulted in the highest number of infections in Canada to date. Fortunately, over time, there has been a general trend toward decreased severe outcomes, such as critical care admissions and deaths among hospitalized patients. This may reflect the impact of vaccine and infection-induced immunity, changes in the characteristics of people infect infected, and changes in circulating strains. Like the winter weather, it can be difficult to predict exactly what we are going to see next, but we do know it's too early to put away your winter coats and boots. Similarly, it's still too early to stop taking the personal protective measures that have helped us weather the COVID storm. At this time of New Year's resolutions, the public health system in Canada remains resolute in our commitment to fostering health within our population by promoting health, preventing disease, illness and injury, to achieve optimal health and well-being for all people living in Canada. Happy and safe Lunar New Year to those who celebrate. Thank you. Donc, euh, on passe aux questions. All right, we'll go to questions now. I thought there would be another statement. For questions, et uh, première question. First question goes to Raymond Filion from TVA. Hello, Mr. Duclos. I'd like to hear you talk about negotiations with the provinces on health care. You said a few minutes ago that you're very optimistic. Can we think, or can you confirm, rather, that you're close to an agreement with the provinces? Answer, indeed, I am very optimist, optimistic, rather, as the Prime Minister said earlier this week as well. There has been a change of tone and a chain of change of direction in the last few weeks. I think that everybody now agrees, including the premiers. They agree that we need to focus on results for the healthcare workers and patients. We've worked uh, very hard, my team and I, to make progress. There's been a great deal of progress since the beginning of 2022. What I note is that increasingly we're talking about additional results with additional the additional amounts that the Prime Minister has said would come in the coming year. These aren't short-term investments. They are long-term investments that are required to protect the, care, the public and fair uh, equitable nature of our public health care system across the country. Question. According to what's on the table, uh, will it be in keeping with the province's demands? That is 35 uh, percent funding. Answer. Currently, we're very results focused. And the best way the Canadian government can help these results be reached. Hi, Minister. I'd just like to get that in English. Uh, how close do you think you are to a deal uh, with the provinces? And also, if you get a deal overall with the provinces, do you see yourself pursuing bilateral deals with individual provinces and territories on specific points? First, I would like to recognize that uh, there has been um, significant progress uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, I'm positive and optimistic as the Prime Minister is also, as he has signaled earlier uh, this week. And that's because we have seen a shift uh, uh, towards a, f a focus on what matters to Canadians, which are results, results for uh, 
patients and, and healthcare workers. Uh, that's what people want, and that's what I believe uh, premiers also want uh, now, and, and, and that's great uh, news for everyone uh, across our country. And great news, I believe, I would also add for the health ministers, my colleagues who've worked so hard in the last uh, year uh, with me and many others, uh, experts and, and partners across our country, to, to signal how much more we need to do together to achieve the right results for people in the short, but equally importantly, in the longer term. Because I might add uh, in passing that what we're seeing now is obviously uh, to a large extent caused by the impact, the severe impact of COVID-19 in the last years. But the pressure on healthcare workers has been there for many years, and that pressure will increase over the years to come. So we need to secure uh, investments in the healthcare system so that we can maintain the publicly funded and equitably access accessible healthcare system that so many people want to uh, maintain in this country. If I could ask you and the doctors as well, uh, the World Health Organization is supposed to be meeting again next week uh, to look at whether to lift the COVID-19 related public health emergency of international concern. If they do that, what impact is that going to have uh, here in Canada? Yes, so that's an important deliberation next week. And of course, we are three years from the initial uh, emergence of the virus or the reporting of the virus. In, in Canada, we're already doing what we need to do, I think. And in the upcoming year, uh, we need to continue to monitor the evolution of the virus. The Omicron variant, because it's still spreading quite a bit all over the world, is going to undergo its mutations. I think we are seeing that in real time. Monitoring that is very important because uh, it's likely to increase its immune evasion properties. And we may have to adjust things like vaccine formulation. So that's why it's important to continue to monitor the virus itself. And of course, any very unusual variants that might pop up. So that's really important. And as the National Advisory Committee on Immunization today in their statement, reinforcing that if you haven't had a full booster with the bivalent vaccine, go get it now. Uh, we still have a ways to go, even for the 65 plus population, about half of them haven't received a full booster. So there's some work to do. And that will sort of put us into relatively good position moving forwards. And we need to, uh, of course, have ongoing evaluation and figure out what we're gonna do for the next fall. Um, so I think um, certainly continue. Um, we mustn't, I think, let go of the gains that we've had in the last several years, including surveillance systems, the antiviral developments, you've got to monitor those in case the virus escapes the effectiveness. And we mustn't uh, reduce the research investments, I think, um, also on uh, long COVID. We still have to learn about that and how to respond. But I think Whatever the decision is made by the uh, Director General of the WHO, I think we just need to keep going with uh, what we're doing now. Prochaine question, Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Next question, Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Minister, I'd like to hear you talk about the negotiations with the provinces again. Why do you think it's important to push for a 10-year agreement? Why is that an advantage? Answer. Look, uh, nobody wants to negotiate in public. I think people want that these agreements to be reached as quickly as possible. What's clear, and the Prime Minister has said this very well, the challenge is that the challenges in our health care system are long-term challenges. We have an aging population. The workforce is aging as well, and worldwide, there is a, a tremendous healthcare worker shortage. In the coming years, there will be uh, thousands. Uh, will be missing thousands of nurses around the world. Uh, it should be said that chronic illnesses are more frequent as well. The cases on which nurses and doctors work are 
much more complex. People have uh, multiple health care issues, for example, mental health and physical health issues. Climate change and air quality have put increasing pressure on the health care system. And these are long-term issues. We'll need to be there in the long term. This is what the provinces know as well. So there will be long-term investments. There need, obviously, there are short-term questions, but the challenges facing some of the challenges facing our healthcare system are very long-term. Question: Has it been through uh, province, federal to province negotiations that you've been able to move things move forward? Answer. We're looking at what our patients and workers face as a whole. Uh, all the provinces are facing common issues. The health ministers I've met in recent months have mentioned the same problems, a lack of access to family doctors. Uh, some 67 million Canadians don't have a family doctor. How can they retain workers as well? How can they recruit workers? And there's also the issue of recognition of foreign credentials. There is a series of conditions that includes mental health care issues. And there's also the question of reducing backlogs in surgery that are have piled up because of COVID. And as everyone knows, as everyone has noted, rather, our healthcare system needs to be update, updated. We need to offer access to data that allow lives to be saved. There also needs to be uh, increased capacity for healthcare workers to collaborate. We have to stop using faxes, for example. We have to allow uh, or enable, rather, healthcare workers to work as teams so that work can be done in time and safely. These are all issues that concern people's health. They also concern healthcare workers and their conditions. They often don't have access to inform information on their patients quickly enough quickly enough to be able to treat them properly. So we're lagging behind other countries on these issues, and that's why the Prime Minister has stated many times the importance of improving the quality and the use of data. We absolutely need this to be able to do a good work, to do, to, for our healthcare workers to be able to do good work. Uh, both Premiers Ford and Legault have now indicated they're willing to participate in some kind of data sharing arrangement with the federal government uh, on metrics uh, for their performance of their health care systems. That we were led to believe was a, a key stumbling block to, to the negotiation so far. Um, what are the remaining impediments and are, are there other provinces that haven't agreed to that that is, that is causing delays in getting this deal done? I believe most people now recognize the importance of data to save lives. Uh, in COVID-19, we could have saved more lives if workers, healthcare workers, had had better access to data and information on people's health and on the system in general. Uh, and, and therefore, that conversation is around how to protect this, the lives of people and how to improve the quality of care given to people. That's what the Prime Minister is signaling when he says that he wants a better and a more modern health data system, in part to support the effort that the government of Canada must keep improving and, and, and enhancing in supporting provinces and territories in all of the long-term challenges that we know are impacting our healthcare system and our, and our healthcare workers. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if our premiers admitted that openly in the next in the near future, because all of my colleagues, health ministers, know that really well. We've spent a considerable time in the last year with the leadership of some key provincial health ministers to work on that file, the modernization of our healthcare system, including a more modern health data system.
Uh, the NDP this week said that no more federal money should flow to the provinces for health care uh, if there was privatization, further privatization in the system. Ontario, as you know, is going to start outsourcing more surgery, starting with cataracts and moving on to others as well. Will this be a condition of any increase to the health transfers to the provinces is adherence with the Canada Health Act and uh, limitation on further privatization of delivery of services, not just uh, payment? We all have different roles in, in this country around healthcare. We have the common responsibility of upholding the obligations of the Canada Health Act. The good news is that everyone recognizes that responsibility of upholding those obligations, and everyone admits that openly. So you've heard that in the recent days. No, we need to maintain public funding. We need to make sure that our healthcare system is equitably accessible to everyone, regardless of where that person may live and regardless of that person's income or financial ability to pay for services. Now, there are, there are ways for the federal government to do uh, to make sure that this is done. No, there are penalties that can be imposed, that have been imposed, that will be imposed probably in the future when those obligations are not upheld in, by, by provinces and territories. But my, in my understanding, based on the recent conversations, is that those obligations are well understood and will be upheld by whatever changes to the system that uh, my colleagues in provinces and territories will, will want to, uh, to make. Prochaine question, Michel Sabat de la presse canadienne. Next question, la presse canadienne. Hello, Minister Duclos. Premiers Legault and Ford are ready to share health care data, as the federal uh, government has been requesting. Would it not be the least of things to state how much money you're offering and tell us if you're willing to increase the Canada health transfers up to 35% of expenses as the provinces are requesting? Answer, that's an excellent question. And you're talking about the means to arrive to an end. That's what we're working on right now. The good news is that the results we're focusing on, that is I and the premiers, we've been working on for more than a year. So we're able to advise our uh, bosses, the premiers and uh, the prime minister, what is coming and what will be done to help the provinces and territories to, uh, uh, to be able to do their job. The prime minister, or rather, uh, we are focusing on results for patients and workers. Question, will there be a privatization clause in the agreement? Uh, uh, the good news, answer, the good news is that everyone recognizes that there is a role to be played and that there is a responsibility that comes with this, that is upholding the Canada Health Act. We need to have a publicly funded healthcare system. People shouldn't be showing up with a credit card to get healthcare services. And the changes that the provinces and territories uh, put in place must uh, comply with the principle of equitable access. They are legitimate quite natural concerns with regard to the provision of health care services by the private uh, sector. The details are important, and we're keeping a close eye on what's going on. Everyone agrees that there is a shared responsibility to comply with the Canada Health Act and uh, comply, meet their obligations. Uh, uh, say to people on Zoom that um, I can confirm now that we will have time to uh, go to questions on the Zoom because uh, we are going to our last question in the room. So last question in the room is from Mia Rapson, the Canadian Press. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Minister Duclos, you keep talking about data and wanting to modernize data, but we haven't heard a lot about what's missing. What exactly is missing in the data that would help improve health outcomes that we don't have now? And what do we need to do to improve that? 
Well, thank you. Let me give you two numbers, 35% uh, in both cases. 35% is the current percentage of healthcare professionals that can work together by sharing data on the health of a patient. That's only one third of healthcare professionals that can work on the same health information that matters for that, that patient. About 35% is also the number of people who have access to their electronic medical records. That's a very low number because people know that they need that information to better care for their health. And in some cases, this information is needed to care for the health of an elderly person, your parent, your spouse. If you don't have access to your electronic medical record, it's more difficult for you to care for your own health or for the health of your loved ones. And as I mentioned, if pharmacists, lab technicians, uh, general practitioners, specialist physicians, if they can't share data on a, on a patient, then it makes it very difficult for them to provide safe care and adequate care to their patients. So in Canada, we are lagging behind in the, term, in the, 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 the quality and the availability of data that healthcare workers um, can use. And it can put enormous pressure on healthcare workers too. I hear stories of nurses who are scared to, when it comes to look after the health of someone coming into an emergency department because they don't know uh, what the health status of that person is. They don't have access to the, the recent test, the, the drug that the patient may be taking. No, they don't know what the earlier health conditions of that patient may be, so they are scared that they, they can't give the appropriate care to those, uh, those people coming to an emergency department. Uh, pharmacists sometimes find their work quite hard too. In the you know, faxes are still used to, uh, to share uh, prescription information between prescribers, pharmacists, and therefore that again generates uh, concerns about the safety and the, and the appropriateness of drug uh, medication for, for the patients that go to see a pharmacist. So there's lots of improvement that we can do. The great news is that some provinces are slightly ahead of, of others. Great news also is that we have the technology to improve our data system in Canada. Uh, never mind also the important value of data to improve uh, information on the, uh, the efficiency of, uh, of, of treatments, surgeries, drugs, uh, the efficiency of how people work together, team-based environments. All of that information is unfortunately to a large extent lost now because we can't use it and we can't therefore uh, we can't therefore make use of it to improve the quality of care for patients. So there's a lot of good things we can do uh, looking forward because we have all the technology and all the goodwill that we need to make that progress in Canada. Thank you. And before Christmas, there seemed to be a bit of an impasse between your government and the provinces. We all remember the, the, uh, the meeting there where uh, we didn't get any kind of real outcome. What was the tipping point that has now allowed progress to be made? Was it that Ontario and Quebec moved on, on data? Was it something else? What has allowed these negotiations to sort of start up from where they were before Christmas? I think the good, the good news comes from the fact that uh, we are increasingly aligned on the challenges that we, the health workers are going through, you know, the stress and the, uh, the lack of care that people sometimes uh, feel and, 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 and fear in our, in our country, and the fact that those uh, challenges that we're seeing in our healthcare system are long-term challenges. Yes, resources and additional dollars will be uh, provided by the federal government, but they need to be invested in ways that will make an, a difference in the lives of patients and workers across Canada. So the results uh, conversation is stronger now than it used to be just a, a few weeks and certainly a few months ago. That's great news, uh, and I, I'm, I, I'm quite optimistic that it's, continued, it's going to continue to move in the right direction. Okay, so we'll pass on the questions on the Zoom. So first question is from Kelly Critterman from the Globe and Mail. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask Minister Duclos, is there any news 
on children's medications, specifically pain and fever medications in terms of the situation in Canada? Are you planning on bringing any imports into Canada? We're hearing about shortages in the United States now. And of course, there could be a second wave of respiratory virus and respiratory illness this winter. Thank you for the question. So first, let's acknowledge that the situation has been quite difficult in late 2022 for parents, uh, caregivers, uh, teachers, and uh, and obviously for, for children. No, there was a, a shortage of children's analgesics, which had all sorts of, uh, of bad impacts, including the stress that families felt uh, around the uh, that uh, those shortages. Now, this, the, the second thing I, was, I would add is that uh, thanks to the hard work of all those that had to be involved, and that included obviously domestic producers, importators, import those that are importing importing those uh, those drugs, the hard work of pharmacists, medical associations, and 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 hospital representatives. Now we were able to share a lot of very precious information among those partners so that they could work better together and increase significantly domestic production. Domestic production in some cases has been multiplied by four in the last uh, few months. Yes, there have been special importations of additional drugs and that has made a significant difference. Uh, the importations of over two million uh, units of, um, of analgesic uh, bottles. So thanks to that great work, imports, but also very significantly increased domestic production. We hear and we see that shortages uh, have started to disappear in the last few weeks. Now, it's not perfect everywhere, but the situation is much better now than it used to be. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks earlier, 3.8 additional, 3.8 million additional bottles uh, in the uh, towards the end of 2022, additional to what would have normally been uh, the delivery of uh, analgesics bottles, and then another addition, one more than one million bottles that will be uh, produced domestically by Elon in just in January. In addition to all of the other domestic production that other companies will also be uh, providing to the market in the next weeks and months to come. Finally. Uh, we've seen that drug shortages uh, in this particular case because of in significantly increase in demand, drug shortages can occur quite rapidly. So I've asked my officials to work with other partners to make sure that we can address those issues in the longer term too if they do arise. So there are important work that is being done with provinces and territories, uh, domestic producers, uh, pharmacists, uh, um, um, wholesaler, wholesalers, so that we are better protected in the future if a situation of that sort were to arise again. Do you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, um, when you talk about data collection, would that be within the provinces themselves collecting data, or would that be a national system of data collection? Well, the most important data collection that needs to take place is in the healthcare system itself. It's data that nurses, physicians, lab technicians, pharmacists can use to increase the safety and the quality of care to people. No, lives can be saved with better data. So in Canada, we don't have yet a modern health care, health data system. We have a system that is unfortunately less good than what we see in other countries. And that's obviously a serious, serious source of concern because if we did have had uh, access to better data in COVID-19 in situations, for instance, we could have saved more people's lives. So we want to uh, step up our, uh, our game in, in having a good health data system in Canada for the purposes of better health care to people and also the purposes of helping workers do the job that is so difficult for them in the absence of appropriate data information on their patients. So that's the most important thing we need to do. As we do that, as we improve the uh, uh, quality and availability of data, 
in hospitals, in, in, in physician offices, in pharmacists, uh, uh, um, across, uh, in pharmacies across Canada. As we do that, then we necessarily give provinces and territories a better idea of how to improve uh, the management of, of healthcare and where they need to invest their resources. No? Is it in this particular sector, in that particular technology, for that particular type of drugs? Uh, it, it also gives them better information on how to improve the efficiency and the equity of care to people. And then we can use that nationally because there is a gain to having national data available to people across Canada. We have the benefit of having a federation of 10 different provinces and three uh, territories. So when we put those data together, then national experts, um, doctors, nurses, you know, specialists, you know, they can use those data and advise everyone in Canada on how to provide better access to the most appropriate drugs at the most appropriate time, the most, in the most appropriate way. So it's, it's all... It's, 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 it's a great source of progress that we can make uh, when it comes to the, uh, as I said, the quality and the availability of data. Okay, donc on y va avec une question de Raphaël. Another question. And then one last one. On aura le temps pour l'autre question. Alors, Raphaël Pirot des PMI. QMI, please go ahead. Oui, allô, j'espère que vous m'entendez. Oui. Euh, Monsieur Duclos, euh, je voulais savoir, bon, le, les premiers ministres des provinces devraient se rencontrer euh, à Ottawa, c'est ce qu'on entend. Euh, je voulais savoir quelles sont les chances que Monsieur Trudeau participe euh, à cette rencontre et quelles sont les chances aussi euh, que ce jour-là, on pense que c'est en février, à la mi-février, euh, quelles sont les chances que ce jour-là soit le jour où euh, on annonce la conclusion d'un accord. Merci. La, la... Thank you for the question. The first thing I'd say is that the Prime Minister is eager to meet the Premiers and speak openly about the challenges of the, our health care system and also how the provinces should be ready as short and long-term partners. Before we reach this point of meeting with the premiers, the provincial and territorial health care ministers will have to share the results we want to work with in common. The good news is that we've been working on this for more than a year. We speak regularly and we all agree on the priorities that I stated just now, the five priorities. So we're ready to go further very quickly. There's still lots of work to be done. Uh, that is between the premiers and the prime minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, before we reach an agreement. This agreement with the provinces and territories would concern not only short-term challenges, but especially long-term challenges here in Canada. Um, euh, ma deuxième question, en fait, c'est tout simplement savoir, euh, ça a débloqué, euh, il y a eu beaucoup de progrès, puis ça faisait très longtemps euh, qu'on ne voyait pas autant de progrès dans ce dossier-là qui piétinait depuis euh, plus d'un an. Je veux savoir, entre les deux, entre le fédéral et les provinces, euh, qui a mis plus d'eau dans son vin jusqu'à maintenant? En fait, on met tous... Euh, on... On met tous les efforts... Answer. Uh, everyone is doing everything they can and this has been the case for more than a year. At my level with the provincial and territorial health ministers, we have uh, we are serving the same patients with the same money. And what I'll repeat time and again, as the Prime Minister has said, is that we will respect provincial and territorial jurisdiction the provinces and territories have the responsibility and the building, the burden, rather, of managing their health care systems throughout the country. But this responsibility is shared. Why? Because the federal government has a role to play. It ensures short-term funding and 
provides other support that goes beyond funding. For example, planning and investment in labor in the coming years here in Canada. Canadians can go from one province to the next, fair, next fairly easily, and that include Cana Can includes Canadian workers. So the government can provide support when it comes to planning what's on the horizon. Unfortunately, experts have told us that we've been unable to uh, uh, to plan for labor here in the country, and there are shortages across the country. So we can help the provinces and territories better understand these challenges when it comes to labor and people moving from one province to the next. There are other examples. Immigration is an important issue. When workers have been trained abroad, the, gov the federal government can support provinces and territories with the recognition of their credentials. We have one last question. There's only a little bit of time left, so I'll ask uh, that the question and answer be brief. We have a question from Cogeco. Bonjour, vous m'entendez bien? On vous entend bien, vous pouvez y aller. Donc, première question, on va parler juste un petit peu de COVID. Euh, on comprend qu'il n'y a pas eu d'hécatombe dans le temps des fêtes comme on l'a connu dans les... We understand that there was no disaster during the holidays, health-wise, when it comes to COVID. We've also seen that there haven't been very many cases of the sub-variant. Are these symptoms of, that we are finally reaching the end of the pandemic? Answer, thank you. That's an excellent question. And I'll ask Dr. New from Public Health Agency Canada to respond. Thank you for the question. What I can say is that no, we haven't reached the end of the pandemic. Uh, I think we've passed the acute phase of the pandemic. But of course, the virus is continuing to circulate in Canada and around the world. It's also continuing to change and evolve. So we need to be ready to adapt and modify our response as a, as a nation and as individuals. There are still variants. The variants even compete against each other. The XBB.1.5 uh, seems to be winning as the most dominant variant. So we need to keep up our monitoring and surveillance efforts with new tools as well by wastewater monitoring to keep an eye on the situation here in Canada. It's good news that the serious consequences uh, linked to the current variants are much less significant than with others in the past. It's important, however, to emphasize to everyone to have their booster dose, the bivalent dose, as recommended in the fall. If you have not yet received your booster bivalent dose, it's the time to do it. COVID isn't like other respiratory viruses. The RSV, for example. We're understanding now that there are perhaps much longer and serious consequences with COVID. It can truly attack the body. So we must continue to take measures to protect ourselves. Otherwise, we could have serious consequences. So we're continuing to say the same, to state the same messages. Get vaccinated. Get your keep your vaccinations up to date. And we'll see what happens. We don't know what will come. Treatment and research are still very important against COVID. 
Perhaps vaccines will have to be modified as well. So uh, the pandemic is not over. We must not let down our guard. As we've said, it's too early to put your boots and winter coats away, even though they're, the temperatures outside might be uh, milder. And it's the same with COVID. We have to, have to stay on guard. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up question? Seeing the hour, I don't think I'll have time. You can go quickly, if you like. Once again, with regard to COVID and vaccines, I can understand you're talking about a booster dose dose. However, some doses in Canada were wasted. Today, Minister Duclos, do you have a figure on the number of doses that were wasted and the number that were uh, transferred to the COVAX program? Answer, I'll ask my team to provide numbers to you. The numbers have changed since the last briefing in November. If you, care, if you like, then we can send you that information. Those numbers, that is. What I would say uh, is that you mentioned the word waste, va wasted vaccines, but I can say that Canada received vaccines very rapidly, and a great number of Canadians turned out for vaccines. We probably saved four to five thousand five thousand lives with vaccines. If we had not received vaccines so quickly, we'd probably be going through an extended period of mourning. What I can say is that every delay, every day of delay in vaccination cost $1 billion in lost revenue to Canadians. Every day that vaccines were not Receive, that there was a delay in receiving them would have cost that much money, a, mi a billion dollars. Abroad, the situation is the same. Now, vaccines are generally available, but had we not had access to high-quality vaccines as early as we did, the Canadian economy really would have suffered. That ends our press conference. Thank you.